Uh, so the previous debate has presented several uh, quite pessimistic scenarios. So I've got uh, a proposal. Do you remember the time uh, without uh, uncertainty and crisis? And can you be an optimist in this world? This is the uh, the topic of the speech uh, by jo uh, Johan Norberg, who is an alpha lecturer and documentary filmmaker born in Sweden. He has written books on a broad range of topics, including global economics and popular science, including progress and reasons to look forward, so on and so forth. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. and the European Center for International Political Economy in Brussels. He promised that there will be optimism in his speech. So let's welcome him, Mr. Jo Johan Norberg. In this beautiful location, and with all the people and the debates that we're having here, actually a location that provides more energy now than it did when it was a power plant, I think. So thank you for that. I am most grateful. I'm also very happy being here, despite the fact that my subject is the world and world events. Uh, I have been assigned with the um, difficult task of uh, discussing why we can be optimists despite the way the world looks right now. You might have heard the old saying that I'm not particularly fond or crazy about reality, but it's still the only place to get a decent meal nowadays. So we're here whether we like it or not. Can we be optimists in this world? Well, to tell you the truth, that's a good question, and some mornings I doubt it. Because with all the kind of events that we've witnessed over the past few years, the rise of populism, authoritarian backlashes in democracies, and even uh, more aggressive backlashes in big dictatorships, financial crises, pandemics, and now Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And with that, the energy crisis, inflation, interest rates rises, even more financial crises ahead. And yet, if we look away from world events, I'll tell you something strange. If we don't look at the specific drama, the horrors of the day, but instead look at the objective indicators of human well-being, we see something strange. Over these past 20 years, we've witnessed crises after crises. We've seen war and financial crises and pandemics. And yet, according to objective indicators of human well-being, these have been the 20 best years in human history, which sounds counterintuitive. It doesn't feel like it, right? But really, when it comes to extreme poverty, the way it's measured by the United Nations and the World Bank, it has been reduced by almost 100,000 people every day over the past 20 years. Child mortality has been almost halved. Last year, five million fewer kids died than in the year 2000, even though we have many more children nowadays. So something went wrong despite all these horrors. And what is that? Well, it is the fact that human beings are a problem-solving species. That's why we've come this far. That's why we went out of the cave and why we survived on the savanna. When we see problems, we try to solve them. And optimism, and this is my take on optimism, it is not a mystical idea that everything will be fine and there will be no problems in the future. Problems are a given. We'll always have them. Optimism is the conviction that we can do something about it. And when we do, we acquire more knowledge and technological capacities, which helps us to solve the next problem that we are facing. This is Julian Simon's paradox. Simon's paradox is named after Julian Simon, the grand old man of development optimism. In the 1970s, when everybody said that we'll face overpopulation, we'll have uh, problems with massive starvation, not just in poor countries, in Europe, in North America as well, because we'll run out of resources. Then Julian Simon said that, no, we are going to solve those problems as long as human beings are free 
to adapt and improvise and come up with new solutions as long as human creativity is free. He said this, yes, adding more people causes problems, but people are also the means to solve these problems. The main fuel to speed our progress is our stock of knowledge, and the break is our lack of imagination. The ultimate resource is people, skilled, spirited, and hopeful people who will exert their wills and imaginations for their own benefits, and inevitably, they will benefit not only themselves, but the rest of us as well. When we face problems, according to Simon, we make an increased effort. We gather knowledge, we invent solutions. And that will not only help us deal with a particular problem at hand, but will also raise our general standard of living and our opportunities long term. He understood this when he looked at problems of scarcity, particularly resources that we feared that we would be running out of. But when that happens, Simon pointed out, information is spread, we notice it in prices. There is a price increase for this particular resource. This represents an opportunity that lead investors and entrepreneurs and inventors to seek new ways to satisfy our demand. A few succeed coming up with replacements or entirely new methods that don't require that particular resource. This is how we move from whale oil to petroleum to electric cars. That's how we went from low-yielding crops to high-yielding crops to genetically improved ones. And since the new innovations are in many ways better and cheaper, Julian Simon concluded that the final result might even be that we end up better off than if the original shortage problem had never arisen. That's Simon's paradox, and that paradox tells us why we can be optimists even in the darkest of times. As long as we are free to improvise and adapt, some will come up with great solutions to our problems, and they might even make us better off. What doesn't kill us might actually make us stronger, not in a mystical, macho, Nietzschean kind of way, but more in a nerdy, lab coatish, entrepreneur in the garage kind of way. That's how we, uh, the problem of uh, feeding the planet, we're still fighting with it, but not in the kind of way that we did 70 years ago when half the world's population lived in chronic undernourishment. Back then, we faced a problem of lacking fertilizer. We were running out of guano, bird droppings to use for agriculture to feed the population. What happened then? It concentrated minds, and innovators and engineers started to work on trying to fix nitrogen and get us ammonia from nitrogen from the air. And they succeeded in creating these artificial fertilizer, which helped us deal with that problem of a lack of fertilizer, but also saved the lives of perhaps two billion people. Two billion people around the world, making us better off than we were before we had that problem. And we can see that in the pandemic right now as well. The pandemic was awful, but why wasn't it worse? Because innovators came up with a vaccine. Within a year of even having heard of the virus, they come up with a new vaccine. It didn't take 3,000 years. That's the, what, what it used to be when it came to smallpox and the polio. It took us 3,000 years to come up with a vaccine. This time, it didn't even take one year. But the new mRNA technology that many of those vaccines are based on, the breakthrough might help us with other things as well, because it helps us to turn our cells into manufacturers of the kind of medicines that we need. So it might help us against other viruses as well, rare genetic disorders, against autoimmune diseases, against cancer. So many clinical trials going on right now. And if successful, they will help us to save more lives every year than the pandemic killed in total. And that's why we shouldn't just focus on the horrors. We should focus on the millions and millions of innovative, creative people who focus their minds and come up with solutions. How do they do that? Well, that shouldn't be a mystery to us here at the Freedom Games, which is described as an event, a meeting of individuals who are curious about the world and open to new ideas. Openness, that's the key because openness helps us to come up with new solutions that we couldn't have ourselves, opening us up to the creativity 
the hard work, the talent, the brains of other people. We see this in open innovation platforms, where often the solution comes not from people within a specific sector, but often people who have a field of expertise that's very far from it. An open platform like Innocentive, uh, where big organizations like NASA can post a problem that they have with trying to predict solar storms, where an oil firm can uh, post a problem that they are having in trying to separate oil spills from frozen water. They have no idea how to deal with it. But they post it online on an open platform and attach an incentive. If you can solve this problem, you'll get hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then anyone can sign up and become a problem solver. And two things stand out when you look at open platforms like that. The first thing is that so many problems are being solved almost instantly, in a matter of hours or days after they are, have, have been posted. Problems that frustrated the greatest minds within organizations and businesses can be solved almost instantly the moment the rest of the world gets a look. And the other interesting thing, and this explains the first, is that, as two scientists, uh, researchers who looked at Innocentive put it, the further the focal problem was from the solver's field of expertise, the more likely they were to solve it. Which sounds incredibly counterintuitive. It should be the experts in a field who solve the problem, right? But if they could, they would already have done it, because NASA and the oil firm already employs the greatest minds in that particular field. But creativity is the combination of different fields of experience and of creativity. New, fresh eyeballs can look at the problem with new eyes. So that the problem of um, predicting solar storms wasn't solved by an astronomer, but it was solved by a, um, a retired radio engineer with some expertise in, the, in um, plastics. Um, and plasma physics, and the problem of oil spills was solved by not someone working in oil, but with cement, but had worked on similar problems over there and could instantly see the similarities and how the different fields could be combined into a new solution. How do you scale that up? How can you scale that up to a national, continental, or planetary level? Well, that's what openness does. That's what openness is about, open societies free markets, the world online. The common denominator between them all is that ideas doesn't have to come from the top in a hierarchical way. They can appear anywhere in the network. And then if they're proven functioning, tested by experiments, adaptations, trial and error and competition, they can triumph and make all of us better off. It gives us more brains and more brawn, more curiosity and more collaboration, more experiments and more exchange. As the British Indian author Salman Rushdie, who knows a thing or two about openness and about fundamentalism, puts it, culture comes from hybridity, impurity, intermingling, the transformation that comes of new and unexpected combinations of human beings, cultures, ideas, politics, movies, songs, melange, hodgepodge, a bit of this and a bit of that, is how newness enters the world. And that's why open societies succeed. It comes from trial and error, it comes from experiments, it comes from feedback, pushback, competition, adaptation, and new innovations and new combinations. And by its nature, this is unpredictable. We can't plan for it. It doesn't come from a committee, it doesn't come from the top. It comes from the whole network, the whole ecosystem of curiosity and collaboration. And that's why open societies are smarter, because they constantly emerge, they learn, from their experiences and from their experiments. And that's why authoritarian closed societies are paper tigers. They look powerful because the moment they face a problem, someone points everybody in the same direction. So it's action, all hands on deck, let's mobilize at once. But what happens if they point people in the wrong direction? And the risk of that increases the moment you centralize societies. Why do authoritarians shout so much? Well, they do it because they are, want to drown out everybody else. And therefore, when they look powerful, 
They lose all the knowledge and all the creativity, the sources of progress, and therefore they can only succeed by imitating and um, uh, imitate successful societies rather than be creative in their own right unless they open up. We've seen this in so many places recently. Look at Russia. Putin's invasion of Ukraine is not just a crime against Ukrainians and humanity, it's also a mistake, something that is destroying Russia right now as we speak. Economically, culturally, demographically, because decisions had been centralized to one man. Therefore, the system lost all the knowledge, all the checks and balances, so nobody dared to tell him that this would be a disaster, or that Ukrainians didn't want to go and submit to a dictator, or that the commanders had sold all the tank diesel on the black market, or that this war to stop NATO expansion would lead Finland and my own country, Sweden, to apply for membership in NATO. You know, we're so fed up with all the bickering and the polarization in democratic societies, the fact that we fight with one another are so polarized on Twitter and everybody else. But you know, seen from this perspective, this is our secret weapon. This is our strength, because it means that we constantly scrutinize all the ideas on the table, and we get more ideas on the table. And we constantly correct others and ourselves. And if someone sells all the tank diesel on the black market, someone else is bound to find out and tell the world about it. China is experiencing the same thing right now. Uh, tomorrow we'll have the Communist Party Congress opening up, and uh, I don't think there's a uh, it will be surprising if Xi Jinping wins his third term. I'm not very much into uh, prophesizing the future, but my guess is that he'll win by 2,296 votes to zero, because that's what happens in, in dictatorships. But that's 2,296 people who don't dare tell him the truth who give him an exaggerated sense of his own brilliance. 2,296 uh, worthless individuals, because they do not contribute what they are seeing with their eyes from their own perspective, and therefore they don't make the system smarter. It's not a system of learning and of adaptation. And that's why he can continue with zero COVID policies that are destroying the health of the Chinese population, but also its economy, undermining China's reputation as a reliable supplier. One reason why many companies are now leaving China. And that's one reason why the economy of China is now in shambles. Another one being that they've run out of things to imitate, and they've closed many of the loopholes that opened up some creativity and dynamic entrepreneurialism in China, because those are the kind of things that Xi Jinping and other dictators do not like. And there are now, it's a population that's shrinking, so there are no more farmers to, to take from the countryside and into factories to raise productivity, and into housing to stimulate the housing sector, which is now crumbling and being destroyed. So right now, China will post a growth rate which is half of what it is in rest, the rest of East Asia. And that's probably an exaggeration as well, because dictatorships fake their data. One data point to tell us the truth of what is going on in the supposedly strong Chinese economy is that desperate property developers in Henan, in central China, are now trying to lure farmers into buying their apartments by announcing that they accept stocks of garlic as down payments. That tells you something about where they are. And this is an incredibly important insight also when we discuss the environment. Because there is the temptation in, in democracies to say, oh, look at countries like China. Without those checks and balances and bickering and polarization, they can get things done. They can solve the environmental problems. Even a smart guy like Thomas Friedman of New York Times said in a famous article that he wanted to be China for one day to solve global warming, because we all know what needs to be done, let's just do it without those, um, that polar polarization and all those checks and balances. But what do the Chinese authoritarians do when they have all that power, when they're China not just for a day, but uh, all year round? Well, yes, they can build twice as many wind turbines as the United States does. They have. 
And that look, looks very impressive. But when you look at the power they're generating, there's something strange. Even though they have twice as many wind turbines as the United States, they produce less electricity than the American ones. Because they're less efficient, many are faulty, and a third of them aren't even connected to electrical grids. Because they didn't build wind generators to solve environmental problems or to make money to respond to correct incentives. They did it because it was in the plan. They had to show that they had built these many wind generators to impress the Chinese and the rest of the world. No, instead, China has more coal power plant than the US has in existence in total. And if you're a friend of Xi Jinping, you can cheat on any emission standards, all the pollution regulation, because he's your friend. He can do anything. Without, he's so powerful. There is no opposition, no polarization, so nobody scrutinizes what is going on. And this is why dictatorships are weak. They can destroy, they can undermine, but they can't build, they can't be creative. And that's the only place to find solutions. And the hope is that there are more good people than bad in the world who want to build rather than destroy. And they can unleash more creativity, more technology to deal with the threats and the problems that we face. There are more people who love liberty. And dictators know this. That's why they censor their own populations. That's why they torture and kill dissidents. Because they're not powerful and self-confident. They're weak and afraid. Because they know that the source of any kind of progress comes from individuals who think for themselves. And that's the one thing that they can't tolerate. And that's why they lose in the long run. They can destroy, they can undermine, but they can't build, they can't become the real long-term superpowers. We see that now from the battlefields of Ukraine to the streets of Iran to the lockdown citizens of Chinese citizens, people who rather fight and risk their lives and torture rather than live another day under tyrants. Which brings us back to the question the headline for this speech, the title, is it possible to be an optimist in this kind of world? And I think the evidence is there in what we achieve. I'm an optimist because we create so many problems, and yet the objective indicators of human well-being continue to improve, even under these circumstances, in every place where people get a little bit of freedom to improvise and to adapt. We can be optimists, and I also think that we have to be optimists. Pessimism is politically dangerous. We become less open, less curious, and less collaborative, and less adventurous. As the disability rights advocate Helen Keller put it, no pessimist ever discovered the secret of the stars, or sailed to an uncharted land, or opened a new doorway for the human spirit. This is what my book, Open, the Story of Human Progress, is about. When I look at history's golden ages, they were only golden as long as they were open. The moment they became afraid, lost their self-confidence, and shut their eyes and their minds to the rest of the world and to its citizens, they began to decline. And the same places, the same people, but progress has, had petered out because they stopped being open. We must not let that happen to us. Tom Palmer quoted Karl Popper, the Austrian philosopher earlier, and I think that's very fitting when we discuss optimism. So let me end with him. Because Popper said, it's not just reasonable to be an optimist, it's our duty to be optimists, because the future is open. Just six weeks before Popper's death in 1994, he gave a remarkable interview for a Polish monthly journal, Odra, his last interview, as far as I know, where he said this, the possibilities that lie in the future are infinite, and therefore we are all responsible for what the future holds in store. The future depends upon ourselves. It is we who bear the responsibility. Only from this point of view can one be active and do what one can. If you're a pessimist, you have given up. Thus, it is our duty not to prophesy evil, but to look at the world from the point of view of how beautiful it is, and to try to do what we can to make it better. 
That's his final words, or as Václav Klavel, the great poet and anti-totalitarian put it more concisely, those that say that individuals are not capable of changing anything are only looking for excuses. Thank you. <laughs>